I just want to say you guys are in the right place at the right time. It's the right decision that you made. It's the first step and it's an important step. Because the journey of a thousand miles, as you know, begins with? Exactly. So my, my presentation to you will be split into about four parts. And I'll start from the end. And I'll start by saying this. You've heard very inspiring stories from shining examples about how to save money, how to invest, how to plan for the future. And you can see them here. I've heard the 11 million being bandied about more than once. See, that's an inspiring story. My colleague, uh, my former colleague Janet was here and she told you about sacrificing, right? Being hungry. And positive examples are very interesting to learn from. But you know in the Bible there's also a story about the prodigal son, right? So my story is not the typical Sentonomi story. That's why I'm starting from the end. And hopefully you'll walk with me. And I said it's in four parts. So let me reintroduce myself. My name is John Allen Namu. I am an investigative reporter. I am a trainer. I am a speaker. And I'm the owner of a company called Africa Uncensored. Africa Uncensored four years ago did not have a turnover of more than five million shillings. Today we're in the high tens of millions. I won't say how many because some of you here might be from KRA. Eh? <laughs> and so we were told it's not tax, it's not tax evasion, it's tax what? Avoidance. So on the Yani have curved that one, Kidogo. And it's a successful company. We're about to break even in hopefully this year, which is quite a feat for a company like ours because most media companies break even optimistically in their seventh year. We are now getting into year five, right? And so it's, it's an inspiring thing for me, right? But African Censored is just one part of who I am. And so let me go back to the beginning about my journey towards financial abundance, which I have to say, I am still on, very early on. In fact, Nini na Mimi to same WhatsApp. We're in the same WhatsApp group. <laughs> and you'll hear why. All right? I'd been avoiding giving this talk for the four years of the life of African Censored. We started on November the 30th, 2015. The following year, in I think February 2016, I joined the class, right? And I went through the 12 weeks. It was an inspiring 12 weeks. The first story that I remember from Washeke was about a lady who used to uh, make mandazis and they were very good. And she decided to become a business owner. And that story has stuck with me because I feel sometimes like that lady. So there's lots of anecdotes. There's lots of not just anecdotes, but really important, impactful information that you will need in your life to be able to succeed, right? But why, was I, why have I been avoiding speaking, like, uh, speaking here for four years? It is because on the 13th week, after graduating, after giving a speech and even having myself recorded on video saying how inspiring this was, I am on the journey to Naenda, Kanandio Wapindio Iyo. I was there, I was ready. I went back home to my lovely wife and I told her, hey, this story of budgeting to Evi at Yo, to Rudi Kwa Mfuko, to Lipe I, no, 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 it ends today. Excel sheet, pap, ah, yeah, let's start. We are going to start budgeting. Oh, uh, how much does uh, Unga cost? Okay, over one month? Okay, sour, sour, we are putting that amount in. It was that meticulous, that nuanced. Niliingia Play Store, I downloaded an app to help me track my spending, right? And everything seemed to be going well. But you know, you know, you guys know yourselves, right? There's a part of you, either over here, ama over here, that tells you that something isn't right, right? And it was telling me, me I was there lengang, I'm there saving receipts. My wallet looked like a receipt book, Kizo Zanakuma at the end of the day. Saving receipts, accounting, doing everything right, except the one thing that hadn't changed, the one thing that Waidaka had put up here, was my relationship with money. So watch to pick a TBT, Sasa. The year was 1998. I was in Form 2. 
Two years before, in 1996, my dad had just lost his job. High-flying um, business person, managing director of a bank. Sunajua serikali hiyo ilikuwa tu ya ufisadi nini the bank collapsed. And with that, our fortunes as a middle-class family, upper middle class heading towards Canaan, Sindio, collapsed, right? And we started to live a lifestyle that hatukuwa tumezoea. If anybody has read Chimamanda's book um, about how, you know, first certain things started disappearing from the table. You know, first it was the, the butter to Kaingia Ligia Blue Band. Then Blue Band disappeared, and then the jam disappeared, and then it became now whatever was on the table you'd eat. So anyway, we move forward to 1998. And I'm informed too, as Waisakia said, I was joining the rugby team, I was trying my best. And one afternoon, I happened to be passing by the bazaar's office on the way to, to rugby practice. And I see somebody who is very familiar to me. And I, I do a double take, and it's my mom, right? And I'm like, but it's two in the afternoon, shouldn't you be at work? That's, that's what I was thinking. And we turned and we met each other and we looked at each other. And she had tears in her eyes. What I later came to learn was that she had just come from the bazaar's office on another begging mission to let her kids, who at that time there were three of us who were in, in, uh, in high school, um, me in Form 2, my brother in Form 4, and my sister about to finish Form 6, um, to stay in school for another term as she tries to sort out her finances. My dad has lost a job. He's trying to scrimp together what he has for consultancies. My mom is an editor at uh, Oxford University Press. The pay is and great. In a, she goes from SACO to school fees to home. That was what it was. And right there and then, my relationship with money became one of fear and scarcity. That, that relationship scarred me in many, many ways that I could not understand. And I think it's something that a lot of Kenyans will relate to. Niwangapi wameona their parents going to, you know, to the bazaar, trying to do all sorts of things, balance the books so that you're able to, to advance in life. My relationship to money was set there. So fast forward to 2016. I've downloaded the app. I'm doing my, my spreadsheet. I'm keeping my, my, my receipts. My wife and I are, are accounting every month. But my relationship to money hasn't changed. So what am I doing? I'm still being that guy who is like, I'm never going to let myself get to that position where a loved one sees me crying as I'm trying to struggle. I understood the sacrifice and that's why it was so painful. And I never want to relive that experience. And so what would I do? Naingia mfuko. Every time I get paid, debt, obligations first. Pay my rent first. Pay school fees first. Pay what first? If there's a guy, you let him say wamkate, you pay him first. Right? And then at the end of the day, you're left with so little, you're like, ay, but now what am I going to save? And then that's when the classes in Sentonomy, no knowledge is wasted, right? But knowledge can also be a burden. Ignorance, the first part of my speech, is ignorance is bliss. I wished for the time that I didn't know the things that I had been taught because I'd have been able to go through life and say, ah, lakini si juicy, let me just continue the way I am. <laughs> but, man, knowledge is a burden. And the knowledge of what I had been taught in Sentonomy became a burden because... There's, certain or, there's a certain order around which you're supposed to handle your money. Like Elsie said, you guys will find out in the class. But suffice to say, it wasn't in the right order. Right? So I continued that way. I continued um, with spending the way I ordinarily would, focusing all of my energy on building this company, this dream of mine, to become this independent media person who can tell the truth whenever and go wherever, as Waidaka said, do silly things like run into, into gunfire, because it is silly. Let, let's, let's, are we together? Those, those things that we do, it's not that he, 
it's not very sensible, but anyway, we do them. Um, and the company was progressing. But here I was, telling the truth to everybody, but lying to myself about my relationship with money. So then what would happen? Any investment that, I, that we had made together with my wife began to erode slowly by slowly. Hizo savings asako, unachovia kidogo, unalipa uyu, unachovia kidogo, unalipia hii. You want a, 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 a holiday katikati, you know things are tight, but you're like, ay, familia, when are, they, when are these children ever going to see Mombasa? Wanaona tuku wa TV. So unachovia kidogo. Before I knew it, savings. <laughs> savings a kampuni, yes, they're there. But that's the company, that's not me. Right? And it became like that. It became a cycle. It was a burden. So what did I do? To be able to, to at least, you know, feel a little better about myself, I stopped doing the things that I was taught in class. Story I could save and to, you know, and, and to go into your Excel sheet, I stopped. Looking at my finances, I stopped. Because it was too much. I'm like, I now this burden, now I know I'm supposed to do things, I'm not doing them right, and I'm not going anywhere. In my head, I wasn't going anywhere. I didn't realize that the small things that I was doing was really helping things happen at home, in the home front. I went back into the attitude of being this person who, you make a big score, that's when you'll save. I don't know if you guys understand what I mean. Unangoja hizo pesa, yani hizo, you know those ones that when they engear their account, you go to the ATM, it's a, you know those ones. <laughs> that, those kinds of chums. Those are the ones that I was waiting for, right? Not seeing that while I was saving a 10 bob here, a 20 bob here, a sock here, it was helping ease the burden at home. But I stopped. That burden was too heavy for me. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't think about the possibility that here I am trying to save na kuna maitaji mengi sana outside there. So I stopped. And at the end of that cycle, I began to realize that what I was doing was hurtful to myself. Like I said, no knowledge is wasted. So this comes to now part two of my story. And there's a, an expression that um, one of my favorite musicians uh, has in one of his songs. In the abundance of water, the fool is... You guys don't know Bob Marley. <laughs> in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. How does this relate to my financial abundance journey? Here I was thinking about this knowledge as being a burden when in many ways it was actually working for me without me being intentional about it. Here is why. When you become an entrepreneur, you start to think, you die to self in a sense, right? You start to think more about the company, more about your employees, more about different things. And at the end of the day, like you've been told, you become an employee of your, em of your employees. You're working for them, you're not working for yourself. And add to that, this fearful relationship I had with money, not wanting to affect my company, but also not wanting to be this person who goes and is one day found at whatever, you know, bazaar or wherever, begging to be able to do something. What did I do? I started to look at myself and, and I'm like, I'm underutilizing myself. So I went from being a journalist to becoming a trainer of journalists. We have a program at our company that does that. But then more and more people would start calling me. And ordinarily, you know what, sometimes when you have money, you, you, you're very foolish. You're like, ah, it is for the go, it is for the purpose, you know, viva, right? <laughs> but what I didn't realize is nilikuwa nimekalia talent and I wasn't using that to be able to help myself. So what did I do? I started to charge a little bit more for, for the, the classes that I would teach all of a sudden, it became less sporadic of an income stream to something more consistent that I could start to rely on, right? Now I'm making money outside of my, of my salary. It's something aligned to the purpose that I have, which I believe is journalism. 
and it's working. I start to speak at more events. I'm earning a little bit more money. But where is that money going? It is feeding this monster called fear that I had never dealt with in my relationship to money. And so the net effect of that was that I was just on a bigger treadmill. I thought that I had stepped off of it, but I was just running faster. I had become better at running faster on a treadmill. But we all know, a treadmill takes you nowhere. It takes you nowhere. You think that you're moving, and you're moving, but you're not going anywhere. It is just you, you're tricking to yourself and you're lying to yourself. So fundamentally, my relationship with money had not shifted. And then, because your relationship to money does not shift as an entrepreneur, as the owner, co-owner, co-founder of a company, slowly by slowly, it starts to affect the very thing that you are trying to, to build. So this fearful relationship that I had to money started to creep into my company. We have a debt here, a lipa. We're seeing that uh, the books aren't balancing at the end of the month. Hey, what do I do? Go to a bank, take a loan, lipa mshara, tutajisotuko, mbele. So the exact things that I'd been taught not to do, I was starting to do because my relationship to money had not changed. Right? But then, God works in mysterious ways. Eh? Can you say amen? amen? I should have been a preacher, I swear. That, that felt good. Um, and he uses very painful lessons sometimes to be able to teach you that what you're doing is wrong right? This wasted knowledge, or this knowledge that I was trying so hard to waste from Sentonomy, became part of the things that I would address when I called myself to a meeting in September of last year. A number of things were happening in my life, um, some too personal to talk about here. But suffice to say, it was that moment where you go, you look in the mirror, and you say, now, my friend, we're going to have a serious talk about who it is that you are. To Kanza, A to Z, from the river of my life. That is why I was able to remember when my relationship to money changed. Because I'd never thought about it. I always thought about that experience um, from, the point of, from a very emotional point of view. And it was an emotional, an emotional thing to have endured. To see a loved one going through pain, sacrificing, begging, specifically around the issue of money, so that you can advance. It was an, an incredibly emotional thing. But here I was, in September going forward to this year, calling myself to a meeting on a daily basis, asking myself, where did these breaks where did this relationship start and how is it that I can end it? So I went through the process of thinking through why is it that I think like this? Oh, it was about this. How did it develop? Now I am afraid of, I'm so afraid of debt that I'll do anything to get rid of it, including get into more debt, which is incredibly insane. It is incredibly cr crazy to think about that. But then I turned to what can I do about it. And so you see this book. Um, this book was one of the first um, sort of products, merchandise that we had produced um, from Africa and Censored. And every class, I had a book just like it. And I'd filled up about four of those books with my own notes, with my own questions, um, with my own insights from the Sentonomy class. So what did I do? I went to where they were, dusted them off, and then started to think about them and read them slowly by slowly. I did that for a, a few days, right? Then I put them down and I was like, hey man, this is too painful. This is too painful. I can't do this to myself again. But then you call yourself back to that meeting <clears throat> and you think, fine, if I don't do this, what is the consequence? One of the main reasons why I joined, started to revisit school fees. When, we, when I started Sentonomy, my friend, school fees was manageable. Nizo, you can pay one time, pop, you know, and you feel good about yourself, ukitoka kwa bazaar, next time, you will see, even I'll pay again like that. 
But then what happens? Inflation, time value of money, eh? The next year, it's 10% more expensive. Unatoa na uchungu kidogo, you're like, sour. The next time, it's 10% more expensive than the last year before. Mind you, I'm a very blessed man. I have a quiver full of arrows. I have four children, right? And so, and, asante. <laughs> and my four children, wako your design your staircase. Ten, eight, six, four. So when one guy takes a step forward, can you remember that Malkiat Singh book for maths? Kuna mwingine huko nyuma yani amekanyanga hiyo step ya kwanza. Right? So what did that mean? Is that every time that 10% would grow, it would compound. It's like 40%, right? And here I was trying to keep up with that, trying to keep them in a school that I knew I should be planning for, otherwise I will not afford. And here I am now calling myself to this very painful meeting. And I was like, this cannot continue. So Janet talked about seasons. My, my, the season that I am in, 2020, is a season of doing things intentionally. So I intentionally made the decision that I was like, no. All of this knowledge that I've been saying is a burden to me is going to be the key to my freedom. I dusted off that book. I started to think about those principles around saving for education specifically. And my wife and I are now about two days away from a medical test so that we can get our insurance, our life insurance done so that we can start to pay together. And then I started to look at the little money that I earn from, it's not little, I shouldn't say little, the money that I earn, the money that I earn from trainings and that sort of thing, and how can I put it to work? I, real, I remembered that we have this farm somewhere and that I, you know, rather enjoy farming, it's therapeutic. I'm just going to throw a little money there, pay a bit more attention there, start to, start to grow something, even if it's not going to earn me money. At the very least, it'll reduce the amount of money that I spend on groceries. And that's another income stream that I can begin to, to save, right? I started to look at uh, bonds again and think, okay, so I have this money that's coming in in April. What am I going to do with this money? You know, so as in Guinea, we say, ah, it's a pesa. We're going to do A, B, C, D, blah, 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 blah. Then when April comes, you've borrowed against the money that you've earned before you have earned it. And before you know it, all that money is gone. So I became intentional about saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. And I've made a plan for it, and I've started to commit money towards that plan so that by the time that, money, that, 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 that day comes when I'm paid, the money goes straight into that savings, right? And so to my third part of my story, and it's an expression that goes like this. He who has never broken a stone can only stare at a mountain. What does that mean for me? I had all of the knowledge to be able to break this stone of financial dependence, of fear of how I spend my money, but I wasn't using that. So I would always stare at my goals like this completely unattainable thing that I will only attain by some miracle. I was going to do this one story that we'd be able to sell and that would set me off on the path to financial abundance. But then you realize that you don't break, you know, you don't, you don't climb a mountain like that. You don't climb a mountain from the top. You climb it from the bottom and even before you start, you prepare for it. He who has never broken a stone can only stare at a mountain. And so how am I breaking down those stones? I'm starting to save just 1,500 a week from anything that I'm able to get. That I'm going to dedicate to groceries. Any, uh, any money above 50,000 shillings that I earn, I'm going to direct towards my education plan for our kids. Anything above that is going towards my pension. Anything above that is going towards a house that I want to buy when I have enough income streams to afford it. So now I have a plan on how I'm going to break all of those stones and climb that mountain. 
And I can tell you, my friends, it is the most empowering thing because finally I can feel it. Again, see, I told you there's like a feeling over here that you have, I'm over here. I can feel that that feeling of fear has slowly disappeared. It started to wither away and it's going out into the ether to affect someone else. But it's not with me. <laughs> it's not with me. Because fear can be a teacher. So let that person be taught by the fear that I have now released into the universe. The final thing I will say about my journey, because like I said, it's not a typical one. My journey towards financial abundance starts or has started with a shift in the mindset. Because all of this knowledge, all of this knowledge, and take it from me, it's a lot, it's important, it's impactful. All of this knowledge will become a burden to you if in your mind you are not at that place where you want to have that real meeting with yourself and say that I'm going to change my relationship to money. I'm just 37 years old, right? But if I had started this earlier, I'd have been a lot further along the way. When I say that to myself, I start to discourage myself. I say I am just 37 years old and I'm starting today because when I am 47, I'll look back and I'll be like, yes, I made that decision. I might have made it a little later than I should have, but I am on that way. Financial abundance. Financial abundance is a mindset before it's something that you can actualize. That is what financial abundance is. It's not having everything in your pocket because we all know that our needs are limit, our wants are limitless. But where we, ha where we are, believe it or not, Waidaka said it, you might not have a job, but you have a mind. We have the things that we need to start. So start to live abundantly from that point of view. Know that whatever money that you have, it is enough for you to start. And even if you don't have it, you have the capacity to make that money and to become free of the things that have held you back the, the shackles that have held you back, mine was fear. And one day you look back at the day that you made that decision and it will be, you know those days when you look back and you just laugh and you smile? That's the day that I'm looking forward to, right? So my friends, you are in the right place. It's the right time. It's the right amount of knowledge. But please, if there's nothing else that you take from my speech today, it's remember, please remember, that it is your mind that is going to help you achieve all of these things. The knowledge itself won't just jump out of your books and out of the books and start doing taxes for you. No, it is you who has to make that decision. With that, I'd like to say Asante Sana for listening to me. Please register for the program. And thank you very much.